happy Mother's Day and thank you all for coming. We are packed. We're all going to have to squish up if any more come in. <laughs> um, it's a wonderful day today to celebrate Ian's 10th anniversary with us. And we're looking at our pictures and more. Boy, do we look young. <laughs> So, uh, fabulous that you're all here. Um, everything is in the notices. Um, all I've really got to say is thank you for everybody who came to the International Food Evening and shared their ethnicity. And um, fabulous that we all could attend that. Um, I have got one thing to say, and Ian might tell you anyway, but the Bishop has appointed a new Archdeacon of the Mian. So, um, it's been a, a little while waiting since... Um, uh, I can't even remember the last gentleman's name. No, it's gone. Gavin, that was it. Gavin Collins, yes. It's been a while since he's gone. We've now got Canon Catherine Percival. That's a new name, isn't it? Apparently she's um, currently Canon, Ch Canon Chancellor and Vice Dean at Portsmouth Cathedral. So, new name. I'm sure she will in due time come and visit us. But um, we shall enjoy the service. Do stay afterwards for a celebration drink with Ian. And we'll start the service in prayer. Thank you. The Lord is here. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Good morning and welcome to our service today. Please sit down. Today is the fourth Sunday of Lent. It's also Mothering Sunday and importantly it's the day we mark the 10 year anniversary of our vicar Ian and his wife Marilyn being with us in the parish. Ten years of humble, faithful, committed and loyal service is certainly worth celebrating. There's much that I could say about Ian and Marilyn's ten years in Porchester, but later in the service Sir Michael Moore will be saying a few words, so I'm going to leave that to him. Mothering Sunday is often seen as a respite from the rigours of Lent in times gone by, it was a time when people in service, mainly in large houses, were given the day off to go home and visit their mothers. So on the whole, it's a good day 
But we also need to be mindful of the fact that for some people uh, this is a hard day. Perhaps some people never had good mothers. Maybe some didn't even know their mothers. So as we continue in worship this morning, let's remember that although this is a special day for mothers, it's also a hard day and perhaps a painful day for some people. So please turn to your orders of service. Let us come before our merciful God and remember with sorrow those things that mean we have not loved God, our neighbor, and ourselves with all our heart, with all our soul, and with all our strength. God of life, eternity cannot hold you, nor can our little words catch the magnificence of your greatness. O God of life, grant us your forgiveness. O God of life, grant us your forgiveness. May the God of love and life forgive you and free you from all that divide, divides you from God and one another. Heal and strengthen you by his spirit and restore you to wholeness in Christ. Amen. Let's stand for our first two worship songs.
actions. Do the actions. In my wrestling and in my doubts, in my failures, you won't walk out. Your great love will lead me through. You are the peace in my troubled sea. Whoa, you are the peace in my troubled sea. Your truth will hold Your great love will lead me through You are the peace in my troubled sea Whoa, you are the peace in my troubled sea My lighthouse, my lighthouse Shining in the darkness to show Please sit down and well done for that participation. So let's pray for the children as they go out to junior church. Dear Lord, we thank you for the young people of our church. Protect them from all that would lead them astray. Encourage them in all they're doing among us and show them your way for the future. We ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen. So children are making their way out. And then we will continue with a special prayer for today. Almighty and generous God, by whose risen and ascending Son, gifts and ministries are given for the building up of Christ's body, the Church, the preaching of the Gospel, and the care of your people. Grant to all of us a sense of our calling and ministry, that we may serve you in holiness and truth, and by your Spirit in us, Make your glory known in all the world, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And we now have our readings.
Our Old Testament reading this morning comes from Isaiah chapter 6, beginning at the first verse. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord, high and exalted, seated on a throne, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him were seraphim, each with six wings. With two wings they covered their faces, with two they covered their feet, and with two they were flying, and they were calling to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. At the sound of their voices, the doorposts and thresholds shook, and the temple was filled with smoke. Woe to me, I cried, I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. Then one of the seraphim flew to me with a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with tongs from the altar. With it he touched my mouth and said, See, this has touched your lips, your guilt is taken away and your sin atoned for. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? And I said, Here am I, send me. This is the word of the Lord. The next reading is from the book of Philippians, beginning at chapter 1, beginning at verse 1. From Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus, to all God's holy people in Christ Jesus at Philippi, together with the overseers and deacons, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God every time I remember you. In all my prayers for all of you, I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. Being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Jesus Christ. It is right for me to feel this way about all of you since I have you in my heart and whether, am I, whether I am in chains or defending and confirming the gospel, all of you share in God's grace with me. God can testify how, long, how I long for all of you with the affection of Christ Jesus. And this is my prayer, that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight, so that you may be able to discern what is best and may be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please.
Hear the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to John. Jesus said, I am the true vine, and my Father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes so that it will be given more fruit. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire and burnt. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now remain in my love. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commands and remain in his love. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. My command is this. Love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends, if you do what I command. I no longer call you servants, because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends. For everything that I have learned from my Father, I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you so that you might go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, o Christ. May the words I speak and the words we hear point us to the one who is the eternal word, even Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. From a small group of Jews in a backwater of the Roman Empire 2,000 years ago, who came to believe that Jesus of Nazareth was the long-promised Messiah of Israel and the Son of God, has grown a movement which has become the world's largest religion, claiming the allegiance of one-third of its population, around 2.3 billion people. That such a thing should happen defies all odds, and can only be accounted for, in the words of J.B. Phillips, describing the early church in the book of Acts. He writes, No one can read this book without being convinced that there is someone here at work besides mere human beings. Perhaps because of their very simplicity, perhaps because of their readiness to believe, to obey, to give, to suffer, and if need be, to die. The Spirit of God found what surely he must 
always be seeking. A fellowship of men and women so united in love and faith that he can work in them and through them with the minimum of hindrance. Unquote. And so after Jesus ascended back into heaven, he left his work in the hands of a small group of men and women known as his disciples or apostles. And something incredible must have happened in them to turn a group of frightened folk hiding for their lives around the time of the first Easter to a body of bold people putting their life on the line in Jerusalem on the first day of Pentecost to declare that Jesus was the Messiah, the Son of God, and the one to whom every knee must one day bow, even if some reluctantly through gritted teeth, as earth's true king returns to complete his work of bringing in the fullness of the kingdom of God, all of which still awaits us. The first leaders included men like James, the Lord's brother, first bishop of Jerusalem. And then there was Peter, the former Galilean fisherman who became its spokesman. But within a few years, they were eclipsed by a former Pharisee named Saul of Tarsus, whose dramatic conversion on the Damascus Road has become proverbial, and who was renamed Paul, later referred to as Saint Paul or the Apostle Paul. Paul was a remarkable man by any accounts, and his influence on the development of what became known as Christianity was immense. His energy was breathtaking. He undertook three missionary journeys around the Mediterranean, winning thousands of converts to Jesus, founding dozens of churches, and encouraging, teaching, and build, building up many more. He was, against all the odds, a great survivor. Tim told me that in a few weeks' time, he's going on a holiday round the Mediterranean to follow in the footsteps of St. Paul. Get ready for this. Writing to the Corinthian church some years later, St. Paul gives us a snapshot of his footsteps. He writes, I have worked much harder. I have been in prison more frequently, been flogged more severely, have been exposed to death again and again. Five times I received 39 lashes. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was pelted with stones. Three times I was shipwrecked. I spent a night and a day in the open sea. I have been constantly on the move. I have been in danger from rivers, in danger from bandits, in danger from my fellow Jews, in danger from Gentiles, in danger in the city, in danger in the country, in danger at sea, and in danger from false believers. I have labored and toiled and often gone without sleep. I have known hunger and thirst. I have often gone without food. I have been cold and naked. And besides everything else, I face daily the pressure of my concern for all the churches." Unquote. So, you want to follow in the footsteps of St. Paul? Uh, yeah, he must have picked the wrong travel agent. <laughs> so, fr and also from the pen of Paul has come half the New Testament having written 13 out of its 27 books. And this includes many famous passages, particularly 1 Corinthians 13, his definition of love, which has become the most popular reading at weddings. Well, you would have thought then that uh, everybody in the churches just loved him and appreciated him and got on well with him. Wouldn't you think that, what a man of God? 
Well, it appears from reading several of the letters in the New Testament that he could be very difficult to work with and, I suppose, to live with. There may be reasons why he wasn't married. <laughs> Some didn't like him because he wasn't Peter, the apostle. Some didn't like him because he wasn't Jesus. He tells us this in 1 Corinthians 1. Others found some of the things he said rather harsh. He could be blunt. He called a spade a spade. He didn't mess about. He got straight to the point. Some didn't think much of him as a person. They didn't think he came up to the mark very much. Wasn't really like the 12 first apostles, was he? He was a kind of second rank Johnny come lately. He didn't suffer fools gladly, and he had big fallouts with other leaders in the church, like Peter one day, and on another occasion with Barnabas. And so unpopular was he that in his last letter, in 2 Timothy, he may have been exaggerating, but it was how he felt. He says, everybody has deserted me. Everybody has deserted me. Nobody loves me. Only Luke. He's the only one that's hang around. But you know, perhaps that's the way it was to be in the purposes of God. Perhaps God delights in using flawed human beings, imperfect pastors, Leaders lacking in many areas in order that we leaders might realize that we are not a group of one-man bands in need of no one else. And that we might discover, if we hadn't already, that there is someone else at work here in the church besides mere human beings. Most of his letters in the New Testament are to churches which needed sorting out. Some of these churches caused him much pain and anguish. But there was one church that he was particularly fond of and incredibly positive about. In fact, it was the only church that he actually had nothing to moan about. I reckon it must have been his favorite one. And that was the church at the Greek port city of Philippi on the Aegean coast. Now, they weren't perfect. Just as he wasn't perfect, they weren't perfect. For example, there were two women who weren't getting on. And he implores them to be reconciled for the sake of the gospel. But you know... If that's all that was wrong, two women bickering with each other, then I reckon that was as near a perfect church to what you could get. Writing to the Philippians from prison some years later, from which we get Paul's letter to the Philippians in the New Testament, he says that when he thinks of them, and he often did, it wasn't with a heavy heart or with regret, or pain. But rather, he says, every time I remember you, I constantly pray with joy. And he adds the reason for that in verse 5, because of your partnership in the gospel. Because of your partnership in the gospel. Alexander McLaren, a 19th century preacher, commenting on this verse said, quote, If all men in pulpits could say what Paul said of the Philippians, and if all people in the pews deserved to have it said of them, the world would feel the power of a quickened church. The world would feel the power of a quickened church church. Not all clergy, however, can remember their former churches or present one with joy, for sometimes their ministry has been marked with conflict, various groups fighting for the ascendancy, many 
under table agendas of people wanting what they want and not satisfied till they get it. And so many have left and gone elsewhere or retired having felt unappreciated and even demoralized. Well, I've been in ministry now for over 40 years. I've had seven different church appointments and seen them all off. <laughs> None of them get rid of me. <laughs> the difficult one went, the difficult ones went before I went. <laughs> I had five of the seven, five of them were as an incumbent or a minister of the church. So this is my fifth pastor or incumbency. One of them was as an associate rector, but in reality looked after the congregation in the absence of the rector for a few years. And then one was as an assistant priest in a rural group ministry. So that's an average for the mathematics among you, mathematicians of six years or thereabouts in each post. So the fact that I've been here for 10 years, as I said, my newsletter says as much about you as it does, does about me. So if you want me to go, stop being so nice. <laughs> and the aspect, as I said, of the ministry at Philippi, which caused Paul to rejoice, was their partnership. Or as the RSV puts it, their shared ministry together. When Paul first received the vision at night, to go over there. It was a call to come over to Macedonia, that part of Greece, and to help them. Not to do it all for them, but to work with them in partnership. Now, Paul didn't need partners. He was a very gifted man. He had a perfect Jewish pedigree. He was highly educated and he was a born leader and a man of much stamina and stickability. And as well as these natural gifts, the Holy Spirit, baptizing him and filling him, had given him also supernatural gifts. Yet this gifted man, Paul, could never have ministered, he said to them, alone. And God never intended Paul to be a one-man band. In fact, Paul was weak in some areas, in lots of areas. And I think the Lord deliberately made him weak or allowed him to remain weak in certain areas. There was a thorn in his flesh. We often refer to people that annoy us as being a thorn in the flesh, don't we? And maybe there was somebody in the church who was a thorn in the flesh. <laughs> and he said, I prayed to the Lord three times to remove it. And you know something? God didn't answer his prayer. <laughs> Have I ever prayed that the Lord would remove certain people from this church? <laughs> I'm not telling you. <laughs> he has. He has. Paul was deliberately weak, and God said, I'm not going to remove the thorn of the flesh. My grace is going to be sufficient for you. So he realized that he needed the gifts of God's spirit, but also the gifts of others in order to complement himself. Most importantly, his partnership was with the Holy Spirit, and my partnership is with the Holy Spirit, for we are not working here for the Lord. You know that? We are working with the Lord, hallelujah, in partnership. Jesus said, I only do the works I see my Father do. So Paul's missionary journeys were directed by the Spirit, sometimes opening doors, other times closing them. For in Psalm 127 it says, unless the Lord builds the house, its builders labor in vain. As Adam said at the start of the service, today is Mothering Sunday. 
And while the modern emphasis, and it is only a 20th century one brought from America, as all good things are, hallelujah, uh, today is Mothering Sunday, and while the modern emphasis is upon, is upon our biological mothers, uh, it was originally a holiday for servants when they went back and visited their mother church. And the idea of the church as mother may be a new idea to some, but it's certainly a very ancient one. Like a mother, the church carries us in her womb. A healthy church is usually pregnant with vision. A vision of how things could be for the world at large and for the individuals within it. Many of whom she does not even yet know by name, for they are as yet unborn. It is a desire she has to embrace and enfold, and to bring those to be born, not only to new birth, but into wholeness and health. She is broody as a church, and restless, and is unfulfilled until she becomes fruitful. She engages in mission and evangelism, and prays that vision into reality. She is excited about the future. She is mother. Who knows if the most fruitful years of this church may not be in the past, but still to come. And so we seek to strengthen our mother here by our giving, not just of our finances, but of our talents and time, that this church may be a place where many find solace and healing and pastoral care, welcome and acceptance and fellowship, as they are fed with the bread of life, the finest of the wheat in preaching and teaching, and where many are birthed to new life through encountering the risen Christ here. And if I can, or if I have been in some small way a help to the church to be that, then that is what my ministry is all about. If I can be, as it were, a midwife to our mother, helping to bring things to birth. And so it has been a real partnership here working with you. I've had an excellent relationship, a partnership with my, for example, church wardens, although I put in brackets, certainly while they were with us, on bracket. I actually look forward to the meetings of the PCC because they are fun, they are united, they are creative, they are energetic. And I often get my own way. <laughs> and when I don't, it's because it's just as well I didn't. <laughs> we've got an amazingly gifted staff. We're at the best we've been for years. And we have a great, good and loyal congregation. Partners together. There is, of course, one special partner who has complimented my ministry here. And that is my beloved wife, Marilyn. She is quite reserved and shy and does not crave any attention or position. In fact, some are often here for a while before they even know who she is. But she has been an amazing support at home, looking after everything, so that I don't need to worry about a thing there. And without her support, I would not have survived here for the 10 years or been able to do what I do. We ought not to have our favourites among our children and as pastors and vicars, I wonder how I relate my seven churches in terms of... The late Ken Tomlinson, who some of you will know, who had known five vicars of this church, and there's a whole list of them there in the lovely new plaque. Ken Tomlinson had known five vicars of this church. And he used to say to me, do you know, you're the best vicar we've ever had. You're the best vicar we've ever had. And I must confess to the sin of pride. And I felt quite bolstered by that. Until someone had a word in my ear. You know, 
He said that to every one of the vicars. <laughs> As to the best church I've ever had, well, I couldn't possibly say. <laughs> Finally, my whole testimony, my statement of faith, my CV, my resin d'etre, my faith, is summed up in the final verse of one of the communion hymns that we will either sing or listen to today. To this I hold. My hope is only Jesus. All the glory evermore to him. When the race is complete, still my lips shall repeat, yet not I, but through Christ in me. Amen. Please kneel or sit for our prayers. There's a wideness in God's mercy, like the wideness of the sea. There's a kindness in his justice which is more than liberty. There's no place where earth's sorrows are more felt than in heaven. There's no place where earth's failings have such kindly judgment given. as we come on Mothering Sunday. We congratulate and celebrate Reverend Ian's 10th anniversary as vicar in our parish. And so, let us pray for the church and for the world, and let us thank God for his goodness praying for all who bring the mothering, caring, nurturing love of Jesus into all relationships, to love each other as he loves us. His nourishing, caring love. So Lord, hear us. Lord, graciously hear us. Almighty and loving God and Father, give us thankful hearts for all who respond to your call to follow Jesus in loving service, leading in ministry and worship, preaching in the power of the Holy Spirit, united in love and faith, proclaiming your ways and purposes for all people, the good news of our risen Lord Christ. Lord, hear us. We pray for all in ministry to be granted your gifts of vision, wisdom, truth, courage, strength, holiness, and humility, and especially in times when faced with persecution for the faith. Leading us into ministry, the truly nurturing, mothering love that longs for the best healing, encouraging growth for each other. Lord, hear us. We pray blessings for Bishop Jonathan and all who minister in the diocese and all Christian fellowships in the area as we reflect on the way of the cross and prepare for the Easter celebration. And we pray too for all those who are preparing for confirmation in their faith at Eastertide. Lord, hear us. Today, Lord, we give a special thanks for Reverend Ian, 
for his amazing energy, humor, faithful, not perfect, but called, his dedication to his calling into your service and ministry in this place and throughout his life, and especially here during the last 10 years. Father, continue to bless him with your saving grace, light, and wisdom. We rejoice too with him that he has been blessed with those who have, by God's grace, been able to share and assist in his ministry. And as he continues to lead us here, we keep him and Marilyn in our prayers. That together as Christ's body, part of the same vine that is rooted in Christ, the one vine that nourishes us, we pray that we may go forward and hear the call in our brokenness faithful, trusting in your strength, Lord. And Father, we pray for all our fellow members who are in care homes or are housebound and unable to be here amongst us. We encircle them with love, assured that your presence blesses them wherever they are, whatever they need. We pray, Father, for those who are sick or in hospital. Bring them your comfort and healing love. And as we spend one moment thinking and holding them in our hearts, let us pray for them. Lord, hear us. Lord, graciously hear us. We pray for King Charles as he prepares for his coronation. We pray for our government, for wisdom and godly guidance in their judgments and decisions. Father, we pray for all the nations of the world and their governments, especially praying for your peace where there is ongoing war and criminal injustice. We pray, Father, for relief in our communities where there is ongoing deprivation and anxiety. Lord, hear us. And so, Father, we pray in all the difficulties that surround us that we may perceive your light and hope shining through. And we know by your spirit, you are with us always. And that nothing in all creation can separate us from your love. Help us to share that compassionate love wherever we are, wherever we go. As it is nourished with the wonderful sap that flows from the ongoing an amazing grace and love of Jesus Christ. And so, Father, hear us. Graciously hear us. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's stand for the peace. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called children of God. We meet in the name of Christ and share his peace. The peace of the Lord be always with you. Let us offer one another a sign of peace. Yeah. 
him is I the Lord of sea and sky. This is the table, not of the church, but of the Lord. It is to be made ready for those who love him and those who want to love him more. So come, you who will have much faith and you who have little, you who have been here often and you who have not been for a long time and you who have tried to follow and you who have failed. Come, not because it is I who invite you, it is the Lord. It is his will that those who want him should meet him here. The Lord is here. 
His Spirit is with us. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give thanks and praise. It is right to praise you, Father, Lord of all creation. In your love you made us for yourself. When we turned away, you did not reject us, but came to meet us in your Son. You embraced us as your children and welcomed us to sit and eat with you. In Christ you shared our life that we might live in him and he in us. He opened his arms of love upon the cross and made for all the perfect sacrifice for sin. On the night that he was betrayed, at supper with his friends, he took bread and gave you thanks. He broke it and gave it to them, saying, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Father, we do this in remembrance of him. His body is the bread of life. At the end of supper, taking the cup of wine, he gave you thanks and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in remembrance of me. Father, we do this in remembrance of him. His blood is shed for all. As we proclaim his death and celebrate his rising in glory, send your Holy Spirit that this bread and this wine may be to us the body and blood of your dear Son. As we eat and drink these holy gifts, make us one in Christ our risen Lord. With your whole church throughout the world, we offer you this sacrifice of praise and lift our voices to join the eternal song in heaven. Please sit down. As our Saviour taught us, so we pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. We break this bread to share in the body of Christ. Though we are many, we are one body, because we all share in one bread. Draw near with faith. Receive the body of our Lord Jesus Christ which he gave for you and his blood which he shed for you. Eat and drink in remembrance that he died for you and feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving.
gift of grace is Jesus my Redeemer. There is no more for heaven now to give. He is my joy, my righteousness and freedom. My steadfast love, my deep and boundless peace. To this I hold.
Satan tells 
Our post-communion prayer we say together, we thank you, Lord, for feeding us with the bread of heaven and the cup of salvation. Keep us in your grace, and at the coming of Christ in glory, bring us with your saints into the life of your kingdom. Amen. Uh, before Sir Michael comes up to say a few words, I have one bands of marriage. I published the bands of marriage between Robert Alexander Hall and Rebecca Amy Malone, both of All Saints Denmead, wishing to marry here by virtue of a qualifying connection. If any of you know cause or just impediment why these two persons should not be joined together in holy matrimony, ye are to declare it. This is for the second time of asking. Let's pray for this couple. Heavenly Father, we lift this couple to you and we pray that as they draw closer to their wedding day, they may draw closer to you. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Sir Michael. No anniversary event, especially a tenth, when by tradition tin, or here's hoping Marilyn, diamonds are given, can go without somebody saying something about the person or people involved. And when Penny and I asked Ian for confirmation that this was included in Tay's service, he said in his self-effacing way, actually no, because it was clearly something he didn't want. Well, we do. And on your behalf, we put together a few words, lasting no more than five minutes. A good deal shorter, I have to say, than some of his sermons. <laughs> but that said, I've never seen anyone falling asleep in them, and we all know they are heartfelt sincere, with a light touch of humour, and inspiring, even if they are in Scottish, <laughs> which I'm still trying to get to grips with after 10 years. I'm of course aware that this being Mothering Sunday, a number of fathers will not be listening to me, as they'll be fretting about the breakfast in bed they forgot, the flowers which have yet to be bought, and of course, how to do the lunch. Some, no doubt, having graduated from the never boiled an egg school of housekeeping. Ian has that great leadership skill of delegation. Get on with it. But the ultimate responsibility rests with him. If things go well, nothing is said. If people don't like it, they will go straight to him. So he needs to be on the ball, and he is. And we read that he gets 20 emails a day, and none of us will believe that all of them are saying, have a nice day. As an international football referee said, that when taking a decision at Wembley, half the crowd will think him right, and half will know he's wrong. And that's where Ian has done so well. His guiding hand on the tiller, and let's not forget he's also a naval chaplain, so he knows his port from his starboard, or rather he should know his port from his starboard, <laughs> has steered us into safe and new pastures. St. Mary's doings have changed dramatically, if not completely, since his arrival. Look at his monthly newsletter, at the huge number of events going on. Look at church attendance, 40 at the eight o'clock. My many naval friends who are church wardens or treasurers tell me that in their church, they are lucky to see half that number at the main service, and most of them have to share vicars. When you inspect a warship, a glance at the notice boards will tell you a lot. Are they neat and up to date? Well, look at ours outside, and look at ours inside. And on that subject, I unreservedly go off piste 
because you need to know that one of our congregation, who over the years has done so much for the church, including the building of the inside notice board, Richard Andrews, BEM, has received a personal invitation to attend the coronation of King Charles at Westminster Abbey. Ian is also the area dean and is very, very busy. But more importantly, he knows and remembers our names. He is not only our shepherd, he is our friend, and his own words, midwife. Being a vicar is not easy, and he's had far more difficult issues to contend with than many of you will ever know. But he has never lost his sense of humor. You see him heading towards the church down Castle Street with his briefcase at pace, with a fringe which do credit to a monk. <laughs> and you will be surprised to hear that he's occasionally been seen running in Hospital Lane, not all that often, mind you, and in athletic gear. Not my sort of athletic gear, but there's no accounting for taste. He has been supported so loyally by Marilyn, and they know everything that's going on in the community. If it's happening, they'll be there. And he will not be averse to a glass of red wine or the occasional whiskey. And he loves a chat with all and sundry, church or non-church goers alike. He has or has been involved with the sailing club, he is sought after speaker at the Porchester and Civic Societies on a range of subjects not at all associated with the cloth, and he is very well read and could give the other contestants a run for their money on Mastermind. And as his chosen subject, I suspect, might be famous Scottish rugby wins over England. <laughs> I suspect there will not be many questions. I know of no greater tribute than to say I want him doing my funeral, and many of you will wish the same. I fly no flag for what many of the senior bureaucrats of the Church of England do, especially putting in costly managers at the expense of vicars and curates, who are after all what it's all about. And despite what our wonderful bishop has said about Ian staying on as long as he likes, I have no idea what the new policy might emerge from Lambeth Palace out of the blue. And I have just one message for them. The best vicar in the business is right here in St Mary's. And mess with him, or try to take him away, and you'll have to take every one of us on. And we're a pretty strong congregation. So, Ian Meredith, happy birthday. And a good naval speak, Ian. Good on your mate. Oh. The cake. We have some uh, flowers to give out. Thank you to Tanya and others who have prepared that for us this morning. So whilst we sing the final hymn, we're going to distribute the flowers to all the women here today. And I'd like uh, some men and children to help with that, please. So if you'd like to come forward, they're all through here. But before we do that, let's pray. Oh God, who gives us so many gifts, we thank you for these flowers. Bless them for us so that they may be a token of love and thanks for all you and those we love do for us. May your blessings be on our gifts and on our giving. For Jesus Christ's sake. Amen.
Children, well done. Thank you for doing this to all of the ladies. And we're going to stand and sing our final hymn, Will You Come and Follow Me? out uh, to St Michael for these uh, lovely words, uh, for the kind messages you've left on Facebook, comments, for the cards, for all your love and for all your kindness. If you're not rushing away, and I know that many of you are because we are aware it's Mother's Day, uh, do stay behind for a glass of wine or a soft drink or tea and coffee and also to, to have some cake as well. Uh, if things are a bit uh, full in the church do spread out into the churchyard if the weather's nice or out into the new room itself and so may I bless you all in the Lord's name as you go Christ give you grace to grow in holiness to deny yourselves take up your cross and follow him and the blessing of God Almighty the Father the Son and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always Amen. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ. Amen.